We walk the streets of Boston like they are ours. No park, no corner, no building off limits. We pass Amakwadi and Chinatown. We strong voice, true and authentic. We unapologetic, we community building, we building up, we bountiful backgrounds of people, of place, of heart. We bringing a marathon a whole community, an inspired neighborhood, a revolutionary city out to the streets, cheering for anyone, cheering for everyone to keep running. And we do, we keep, we keep running. Welcome. I'm Nat Shidley, President and CEO of Revolutionary Spaces, and I am delighted to be your host this evening for Common Threads, a co-production with WGBH Forum Network. Tonight's program is part of an exciting year of conversations, performances, and exhibits that we have in store for this year's 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. Here at Revolutionary Spaces, we steward Boston's old state house, and the Old South Meeting House, where the meetings that gave rise to the Tea Party took place in December of 1773. So I think you can imagine this year is very important to us, and we are honored to have an amazing group of poets, artists, and historians here tonight to help us kick it off. We are also thrilled to be joined by our partners and friends at WGBH's Forum Network, which is a public media service of WGBH that collects thousands of video and audio lectures from the world's foremost scholars, authors, artists, scientists, policymakers, and community leaders made available online to the public for free. We are so excited to be in such excellent company. Both the Forum Network and Revolutionary Spaces would like to thank the Lowell Institute, as well as other funders, the New England Women's Club Fund, um, and our other generous supporters who, whose contributions enable us to produce free public programs like this one throughout the year. This program is also supported by funding from Mass Humanities, made possible by the National Endowment for the Humanities through the American Rescue Plan. So thanks to all of you for your support. It is our practice before starting any public event like this one to begin with a brief land acknowledgement since the two buildings that we care for have a complicated history. They are simultaneously home to important ideas of freedom and democracy and places where settler colonialism took root with devastating impacts on native communities throughout New England and beyond. We therefore pause to acknowledge that these two sites stand on the occupied unceded homeland of the Massachusetts people. We honor the many native peoples who are connected to this place, including but not limited to the Nipmuc, the Massachusetts and the Wampanoag peoples. We are committed to dismantling the destructive legacies of settler colonialism and building new pathways to understanding and dialogue. Thank you. Tonight, we have a real treat in store as we embark upon a year dedicated to commemorating a seminal moment of fracture and division in our nation's past. We thought it might be helpful for us to begin by asking what common threads tie us to one another today? What ideals can or should bind us together as a people, as a nation? This past September, Revolutionary Spaces engaged Boston's Poet Laureate, Portia Olayawola, to write an original poem inspired by the words of our community. Uh, those words were shared in response to several prompts that um, were put forward at an event that members of our community attended. Um, and Portia is going to share that poem for the very first time tonight. And we have brought together this great group of artists, writers, and thinkers to respond um, and to have dialogue about the ideals that define us. So with that, I am thrilled to introduce our guests and then we will get underway. So um, our star tonight, Portia Olayawola, is a writer, performer, educator, and curator who uses Afrofuturism and surrealism to examine historical and current issues in Black, woman, and queer diasporas. 
She is an individual world poetry slam champion and the founder of the Roxbury Poetry Festival. Elia Wola is Brown University's 2019 Highmark Artist in Residence, as well as the 2021 Artist in Residence at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. She is a 2020 Poet Laureate Fellow with the Academy of American Poets. Elia Wola uh, earned her MFA in poetry from Emerson College and is the author of I Shimmer Sometimes Too. Elia Wola is the current Poet Laureate for the City of Boston and her uh, plentiful work can be found in or forthcoming from uh, Tri-Quarterly Magazine, Black Warrior Review, The Boston Globe, Essence Magazine, Redivider, The Academy of American Poets, Netflix, Wilderness Press, The Museum of Fine Arts, and elsewhere, including right here in tonight's program. Thank you for being with us tonight, Portia. Charles Coe, is a poet, a prose writer, and a teacher of writing and a musician. His books include All Sins Forgiven, Poems for My Parents, and Picnic on the Moon, both published by Leapfrog Press, as well as Spin Cycles, a novella published by Gemma Media. He received a fellowship in poetry from the Massachusetts Cultural Council and was selected by the Associates of the Boston Public Library as a Boston Literary Light in 2014. In 2017, he was an artist in residence for the city of Boston. There's a certain theme here. Um, Charles served as a poet in residence at Wheaton College and at the Ch Chautauqua Institution in Western New York and has taught in Dingle, Ireland for the Bay Path University MFA abroad program. He's an adjunct professor of English at Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island, teaching poetry and nonfiction in the low residency MFA program. And I'm proud to say that Charles is also a member of the board of Revolutionary spaces. Charles, thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks for asking me. Darren Cole is a multidis multidisciplinary artist who seeks to blend emerging technologies with contemporary art practices through the form of site-specific research. As a film and video professor at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, he created performance-based work using 16 millimeter film and interactive video. He was the first ever digital storyteller at Boston City Hall. Art New England Magazine nominated him as one of the top emerging artists of 2019. And as an artist fellow at Revolutionary Spaces, his installation, When Up, Look Down, was on view at Old South Meeting House, one of our sites, um, in 2021 and 2022. Darren, thanks so much for being with us tonight. And uh, Benjamin Karp. Uh, is our uh, token historian here uh, amidst a, a group of artists and writers. Um, uh, uh, ben is a professor in CUNY's Graduate Center, uh, where he focuses particularly on urban politics, society, and culture in 18th century America. He's taught survey and seminar courses on American military history to 1900, colonial American history, revolutionary American history, women in early America, and fear and violence in early America. His books include the forthcoming The Great, Fire, Great New York Fire of 1776, A Lost Story of the American Revolution, Defiance of the Patriots, the Boston Tea Party and the Making of America, which I think every member of our staff at Revolutionary Spaces has read and loves, and Rebels Rising, Cities and the American Revolution. Uh, ben, I want to welcome you back since you were with us last week for a separate panel. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me again. Great. And thanks to our audience for joining us. We're really glad to have you with us tonight. All right, um, I am going to turn things over now to Portia and ask her to read the poem that um, she is debuting with us tonight um, and provide any context, Portia, that you'd like for that work, um, or we can tease that out in discussion when you're through. So please take it away. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here and excited to be on this panel with um, these incredible artists, writers, uh, professors, historians, um, and really thrilled to have the opportunity to like use other people's words um, to, to make a, a new creation, um, having a chance to kind of like look at some of the responses to the forms uh, was really exciting. And it was like really exciting to the, to know what people were thinking about in the context of some of these questions around 
um, the city of Boston, what makes a revolution a revolution, what makes a community a community. Um, so just wanted to say that. And, and so this poem I'm about to read is uh, composed entirely of community responses from that questionnaire. And it is called, Every Day, A More Pe Perfect Revolution. With the footnote, the poem is influenced by African-American vernacular English in that it uses the copula as vehicle. We revolutionary city. We cradle that rocked the world. We cradle that rocked our work. Cradle that keeps the belly full a child safe, a person empowered, a heart whole, we rich city, we rich history. We don't forget, we fight for, we forward thinking, we forward being, we fabric and forefront, sunk any fallacy that cradled us weak, invisible, poor, we confront and reinvent, we common good, we good and we common, we equal citizen, we not afraid after sunset, we not afraid after strong storm, we not afraid to tear down what does not work, what has made us suffer, we not afraid of our splendid, of our warmth after hug, of our loud full selves, we proud and we gay. We walk the streets of Boston like they are ours. No park, no corner, no building off limits. We pass Amakwiti and Chinatown. We strong voice, true and authentic. We unapologetic, we community building, we building up, we bountiful backgrounds of people, of place, of heart. We bringing a marathon, a whole community, an inspired neighborhood, a revolutionary city out to the streets, cheering for anyone, cheering for everyone to keep running. And we do, we keep, we keep running. That is it, that's the poem. Um, but Portia, thank you for sharing that. And thanks for the powerful way in which you shared those words. Um, I, I thought maybe we we should begin by just inviting you to tell us a little bit more about your experience with writing this poem. Um, I'm not sure if you have had the experience before of working with other people's words in quite this way, um, but whether you had prior experience or not, um, what was it like to try to balance your voice as the poet with the voices of those with whose words you were working. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it was great. I think one, it like took the pressure off, right? Because I think sometimes the hardest part about writing is writing. Um, you know, the editing is where the, all the fun happens. Um, but like getting out those first ideas and those first words oftentimes take, requires so much thinking beforehand. Um, and this was really exciting because some of it had been done. And so it almost felt like um, an analysis, a deep analysis of what the text was. It felt like <clears throat> a little bit of puzzle building or people building. And I think for me, I love found poetry. I love thinking about them. I love the ways in which um, they are created um, and what they what they can like open about poetry. Um, and I got really excited to be doing it. And, and and we were talking a little bit about this before we got on. But I was saying, you know, specifically with found poems, in addition to just the material, the text of the poem. I think what matters um, just as equally is like the way in which it was created. So I, I was really wanting to, one, I was debating adding my own voice and I was like, oh, I don't know, do I want to? I could, you know, and I could piece this together, but I feel like the comp the composing of it in and of itself is, you know, my voice, if you will. Um, and so what I really wanted to do was like honor 
what was said in, in the questionnaire, what people responded with. I wanted to like, if, if this was some kind of reflection of, of the thoughts of the people um, and folks in the city, then I definitely wanted that to be shared. I wanted you not to have to necessarily read the responses, but also grab and understand um, what folks were saying and also have that be the actual language that folks use. And then I also just wanted people to know who was in the building, right? Who claimed this space um, as home. So I hope some of that came through as well. Yeah. And then I'll also make <laughs> poets. We go on and on forever. Um, don't ask a question about process. No, but I also wanted to, I'll just say in thinking about process and the way this came out, the footnote also, I was thinking a lot about um, whether or not to talk a little bit about, you know, the use of AA, AAVE more so as this like anaphora and thread that's moving through the poem, but it also feels very important to like the fabric of, of the nation. So um, I was thinking about all of those things. So. Can you say a little bit more about that last point? Yeah, well, I, um, yeah. So I think really just the language in the poem is using this, the, the access to the be, to be verb, um, and like kind of mushing out some of the verbs and going straight to, as opposed to we are confronting as we confront. But what I think what I'm also saying is that, you know, this poem is obviously about Boston, but then that means it's also about America, right? And America's history. And so it feels necessary and important to acknowledge that the the building blocks and the structure of this is, you know, apparent in this this language and also and you know what we know to be true of the country, if that makes sense. You know, a more perfect revolution, you know, footnote. So anyway, though those are some that. thoughts about process. Yeah, yeah. No, um, that's great. That's yeah. great. And I I I think there's there's a lot more that we could unpack with regard to process, but I want to bring in um the other members of our panel here. Um, maybe by by starting with this question, um, the the recurring beat uh throughout the poem is the word we. Um, and and I, I just wanted to ask our panelists what how you heard that or how you hear that we um, and and what does it mean to you uh, in the context of this poem or in the context of your lives? One of the things I find one of the things I find fascinating about the poem is how it starts from a place of of comfort and hope and gradually gets more insurgent. Um, and of course, so many of the fights in our country is about who gets to count as we, right? Um, I mean, we all take for granted, right, that the Constitution starts with we the people, but defining the boundary of who the people are, who gets to count as a citizen, who get, gets to make full claims on citizenship is um, is kind of the whole ball game. And I, I just really appreciated how the poem played with that. While also being assertive of what uh, of, of what Portia thought the answer to the, that question should be. Charles or Darren, do you have any any thoughts you'd like to add? Yeah, uh, but, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear what you just said, Benjamin, because I think it really, uh, it's a bullseye in, in terms of this progression to um, uh, sort of claiming, a claiming process, if you will. And, and one of the things, Portia, I find so exciting about the poem is that these are, when you talk about Boston history, these are voices who haven't been part of that conversation uh, traditionally. And this, this poem puts them front and center. I mean, they are, they are putting themselves front and center and you, and you, are, the, you are the poem in which the, 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 that allowed them to do that. And so that, that whole process of uh, looking at, you know, when you hear the word commonwealth, the commonwealth of Massachusetts, exactly what does that word mean? I mean, Whose wealth and 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 who is is holding it in common, and so without um, without inserting any sort of editorial voice of the poet uh, in there, you 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 bring that right front and center, and you, you did a a beautiful job of uh, weaving this tapestry. Yeah, I would also like to echo the sentiment that. For me, and uh, I heard that you're talking about like the pain that comes with this poem, but also there's like a beauty to it. And I think something that 
I'm always reminded of when I hear the word we, and I'm thinking about this like country that we're in, is that it's so easy for us to be divided. And you're reminding it that you're reminding us with this poem that it's always going to be we, or there wouldn't be all of us here in this country. So I feel like for me, that seems to pick up that sort of pain and struggle as you make it from the top to the end of this piece. Portia, is there anything you'd like to add in response to those thoughts? Um, not really. I, I mean, I love what everything everything that folks are saying. I feel like it's really um, interesting, and like I, I just love the way in which folks are holding um, this, this this very short word, probably one of the shortest or the shortest word that appears in poem. How heavy it is. Um, yeah, that's that's it. I'll I'll, I'll leave it there, but. Um, I, I think some of the comments uh, capture the the tension between past and future that you express in the poem, and that the the um, respondents to the questionnaire shared in in their thoughts. Uh, we forward thinking, we forward being. Um, you know, it's powerful. And, uh, you know, here we are in Boston, right? We're everywhere we look, we're surrounded by reminders of the past. Um, we certainly in the public history business are guilty of trying to call even more attention to them as we approach the 250th anniversary, anniversary of our nation's founding. Um, so they're they're claiming a hold on our attention. Um, but but is it possible for us to use that past not to look backward, but to be forward looking, to be uh, forward being? Uh, wh what does it mean to use the past as that kind of platform for looking ahead? No, I, I think that's a heck, oh, sorry, Benjamin, you were fixing no, to say something. Go ahead, please. Um, I think that's a, that's a heck of a question. So obviously you can't make sense of what is or what you would like to be unless you are willing to look at the past. Um, but, but, but the catch there is that um, so much of what has been passed, on, passed down to us as history is received wisdom. And, and, it, and it, it suits the agenda and interest of certain people to, to present that history. And so um, this is maybe a little bit of a tangent, but when I, but when I look at a statue of, a, of a, an august man, or our name on a building of somebody who was a slave owner, you know, on a, col uh, a colonizer. My first impulse is to get rid of that. My impulse is to look at it, talk about it, look at who this guy was. Let's instead of just ripping the statue down, and some of them do need to be ripped down. Uh, instead of just automatically having that to be our first response, let, let's let's look at it, let's talk about it. So. A lot of the history of Boston, is, especially when it comes to um, race and community and inclusion, is is very problematic. But uh, we, we if, if we can't look at that stuff, we can't make sense of where we are and where we're trying to get. So Benjamin, please. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look at how transformative. I agree with everything you said. I mean, look at how transformative this poem is trying to be, starting with history, but then also talking about community common ground, no limits on space, right? Uh, and, and locating the we in places that would have been unfamiliar to the founding fathers, right? In, in, in the queer community, among the Passamaquoddy in Chinatown, right? The, the, the idea of, of holding that for yourself and, and, and looking forward and, and repurposing some of the, uh, the ideals that the, that the founding fathers proclaimed to be professing, but kind of taking that for our own day and trying to uh, um, and trying to put those ideals forward, I, I thought that was really powerful. Yeah, I'll just jump in and say, as a person who exists both as an Afro pessimist and an Afro futurist, I think it is yeah always imperative to be thinking about using um, the past to move forward. You know. Um, as a map or as a blueprint. I even saw this thing right before I got on. I'm like oh, too, entirely on social media entirely too much, but uh, I think Ujima Boston posted something about um, remember the future, right? But like thinking about these mm -hmm. things as tangled conversations um, with themselves and like just to go back to <laughs> something we were talking about before um, we started recording, but also in regards to what, you know, Charles just said um, about like statues as conversation starters or these markers as conversation starters and thinking about, you know, the ways in which we didn't acknowledge certain people, 
right, in the past, but how do we do that in the future and make sure it doesn't happen again? And i.e. thinking about, you know, the new sculptures that, ju that just went up in um, the Boston Common, um, you know, as far as like starting a new conversation, right? And uh, I, even though it's historical, it does something to set, set naming for the future. And I know Charles, if you want to add on about the sculpture by all means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure yeah. That, I mean, it, sure. it, yeah, wh what do we make of the embrace as an intervention in this story that Boston tells itself in the country about what the city's all about? Well, I, I, I've, I've been twice. Um, uh, I saw some photographs and I decided, you know, I wanted to see it and walk under it and walk around it. And I was absolutely blown away by it. Um, I know some people uh, don't like it, but and and their ideas might shift over time because often the response to a new piece of public art is, is uh, shaky. But over time, people, uh, if you try to uh, tear down the Eiffel Tower or the facade of the the uh, Sydney Opera House, uh, you, you'd you have riots in the streets. And a lot of the people who would be rioting were people who hated the original <laughs> proposals and design. But anyway, I, I, I would like to see a shift from a conversation about whether you like embrace, the embrace, to look at how, when you talk to people who are from outside of Boston, uh, one of the first things they'll say about the city, especially my uh, African-American friends, is, oh, Boston is a racist city. That's just part of the narrative. And of course, there is a tremendous amount of that that's warranted. But I see the, the energy and the resources and the focus that have been put into creating the embrace as a new element to that conversation. It, it, it's, a, it's a welcome new thing to say about Boston in terms of uh, race relations. And, you know, I, I could kind of go on and on because I was really charged up when I when I saw the embrace. But that's basically what I, I think is this. It's something new uh, about race relations that Boston can say about itself. And, and I think that's welcome. Thanks, Charles. Um, does anybody else have a comment about the embrace? Yeah, I guess I'll just say this um, as well. I haven't had a chance to see it, but it's been on my mind for about a year now. <laughs> and now uh, it's always like festering that now that it's up. Um, and so I've like got to go see it. I can't wait to walk underneath it. I've seen some pictures. I've been like following the, the national discourse as well as the local discourse has been all really interesting. Um, but I guess what I'll say, there's so much I could say. And I guess what I'm thinking about in the context of this conversation is, again, what does it mean for Boston, the city um, that is this revolutionary city to put this statue up in the first public park in America? You know, I, I'm thinking about that. And what does it mean to like, again, name this as space? And also in the conversation of the 54th Regiment statue that's also there. And I don't know if there are any other sculptors in, in the comment, but I think it's something about that as monumental, pun intended, but something about that feels <laughs> important about naming space, so. That's great. Um, Portia, you you play with the idea of Boston as a cradle. Um, and I, I wonder if we could explore a little bit um, what you're doing there. Um, you know, Boston has long told a story about itself, that it's the cradle of liberty. Um, but your cradle's quite different from that cradle that is, you know, the sort of tourist facing identity of Boston. Um, what are you trying to what are you trying to explore there? Um, were you were you consciously trying to unpack that? Um, or or was is that is that coming to you from the words of the respondents? Um, help us understand a little bit. Yeah, totally. Um, so definitely playing with this notion of cradle of liberty. I'm actually looking at the original responses in the notes. Um, and I will say what makes or can make Boston a revolutionary city is the question. And the response is the cradle that rocked the world, right? Um, and for me, whenever I see the, this cradle, 
I do think of it as, you know, like, I hate, I totally hate this idea that Boston is this beacon. And also it is, you know, <laughs> uh, like, uh, you know, I'm always like playing with that and thinking about that, but it, it really is. And what does that mean? You know, um, and, and how do you play with that? And, and how do you hold the country accountable and the city accountable to that ideology that it is uh, meant to take care of folks and take care of things. And I'll also say innately when I hear cradle, I only think of rocking or I only think of movement and shaking. Um, and so that, that I think that sits with me every time I think of the possibility um, as well as like, I guess the uh, opposite end of uh, great parent taking taking care of children you know when it, it when it's not done well or when it's a smothering thing what happens then you know um so all of those things are in in, in my head but it I, I thought the word was powerful um in in part in the context of the time that we are living in right a, a cradle can feel like a place of safety um and we're we've passed through a a very difficult or maybe are, are not yet through, but the, the passage of the last three years or more, uh, whether it's the pandemic or the divisiveness in our politics, we, we feel riven and divided on every side. Um, and, and I wonder if, if, um, if we might invite the, the panel to explore a little bit, um, you know, what that experience has been, uh, you know, how, how does that sit with us? Um, is the cradle a place of safety? Um, and also the idea of common good that, Portia, you share um, in the poem here. Um, how, how, how has this experience that we've been through over the past three years or more changed how, how, we've, how we connect with those ideas, what's what's in common, what is the common good? Um, where is that source of strength and safety? That's a tough one. I was gonna say that uh, the cradle makes me think of the, the myth, uh, the Greek myth where Hera sends two snakes to kill Hercules in his cradle, right? Um, that's, a, a, that's another one. And, all, and also actually there's a book that played with the concept of Cradle of Liberty, right? This book by Russell Bourne. I don't know if people can see, but called Cradle of Violence, where he kind of talks about the, the you know, the Boston waterfront and says like, hey, this wasn't just like, this is the revolution is not just a bedtime story, right? It's this, um, it's this story of social contestation, right? Let's think about you know, Crispus Attucks and the others at the at the Boston massacre. Let's let's look at Boston as a place where um, people were clashing over their their rights and their claims to um, to community. So, uh, right. Yeah. Cradles rock. Right. They don't just lull us to sleep. Right. So it's um, it's it, 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 I, I think historians have been playing with that notion and trying to subvert that notion of cradle of liberty for a long time. I mean, Born was drawing on some of the classic kind of progressive social historians from the from the 1970s and beyond. Yeah, I like to think a lot about just the fact that, like, for me, as someone that's actually not from Boston, um, every time I go home, I just hear everyone talk a similar echoes to what everyone else is saying, like, oh, it's a super racist city. Um, but then when I'm here, I meet so many people from so many different diverse backgrounds that are oddly enough, wildly more diverse than maybe where I'm from. And then all of a sudden I'm like, maybe this is sort of reminiscent of that cradle and not so much of the crucible, but at the same exact time, this past year I had the ability, I feel like honored, but it's also sad. My uh, grandma turned a hundred and also died. And I think about her relationship talking about the different things that, happened along her life growing up uh, in the South, doing the things that we sort of know historically were happening at that time. And it just like adds that shift to how do we actually change what is happening moving forward? So I think for me, a lot of times it's like, you need both of those things to come together, but at the same time, 
it's almost like the cradle to me is like this birthing or this like creation of something new. And we're constantly using the crucible. I think more as like an action word. It's like, how can we start to dismantle or uh, put some energy against the things that aren't working from our past? Mm, yeah, for sure. You know, when I hear the word cradle, um, you know, you think of nurturing, you think of care. Uh, um, uh, who's in that cradle? And, and, and that question to me gets back to who's at the table? You know, it's a different way of asking the question of who's at the table. And I think the the idea of, of, of Boston as a cradle of liberty, there's certainly a lot to it, you know, in terms of looking at a lot of the great debates um, and social activism and so forth. But it, it it's also a notion that can be romanticized in terms of looking at who was being nurtured, you know, who's being rocked in that cradle. And and Portia, the the people, uh, the people who are 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 in your poem, uh, a lot of those folks weren't being rocked in that cradle. So that's something that uh, without sort of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, if I can like uh, mix a metaphors terribly, uh, I, I think that question needs to be part of the conversation. Like who was in that cradle? Yeah, totally. Um, I love all of this dialogue. And I, and every time we think about um, like who's showing up in a poem, I'm also just going back to the responses, right? And thinking about that question around the past um, and who's present now. Right. So every time you all say or bring these this language into the conversation, I'm also thinking about those folks who answered the questionnaire and like, yeah, thank you for being there. And like we hope that you're being cradled now, if you will. Can I say something about the folks answering the questionnaire? I'm thinking if I were part of that conversation, if I were one of the people who provided some of the text for the poem. I would be so proud. I would just be walking around with my chest stuck out. When, when, when I see that poem, I would be reading it to my, my family and friends, and I would be pointing at, hey, look, this is, this is what I said during the, during the conversation. So to give people that, that, that opportunity to be uh, part of such a project uh, is just it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I, I echo that, Charles. Um, we when we shared your work with our staff, Portia, um, I, I think not a small number of staff had um, tears well up in their eyes. It, it just it really it it speaks powerfully to um, to some of the work that we've been trying to do, but also to the experience of um, having to keep putting one foot forward. Right, the the so we keep running is just such a powerful comment at the end. Um, Portia, you write, uh, we not afraid after strong storm. Um, and we talked a little bit about this already, but I, I wanted to ask um, all of you to comment on what those strong storms are um, in your mind that we've been through. Um, and um, how are we made stronger or are we made stronger by them? Um, how are we not afraid? Well, I, I want to start with the 18th century. Storms were actually a really important metaphor for defiance of the patriots. Not too many people comment on this, but all the epigraphs of the chapters, a lot of them are quotes from the 18th century having to do with tempests. Um, I mean, Boston was a seafaring town, right? And so like the, the men, young men are always going out to sea. And so storms were very real and, and threatening to them. And they see the acts of parliament as a storm kind of crashing on them. And then they whip up their own storm, right, in, in response. And so everything about revolutionary Boston is just um, really tempestuous. And um, I mean, I, I don't know that I can speak as well uh, uh, to what lessons it holds for us uh, today and and going forward, um, but yeah, I was I was I was really struck by uh, the strong storms uh, uh, portion of the poem as well. Uh, 
Thanks, Ben. That's that's helpful context for sure. Um, yeah, uh, storms were were a, an important feature of life in the 18th century for sure. Darren, um, did you want to chime in? Well, I guess I mean for me, I think it goes. It's obvious, you know, that you know violence, uh, police violence against people of color is definitely high on that list for me. But that's actually not what I wanted to talk about. I think for me, the storm is actually the media. Uh, I feel very like actually threatened by the media, especially entertainment for me, like goes uh, is like one of the highest sitting places. Like I don't even really feel comfortable most days anymore watching like most things that are produced that are supposed to actually change like other people's perspective on how they should look at uh, uh, different groups of people. I'm always generally offended that like some of the best media makers or filmmakers or whoever can't even understand that there is these powerful effects that are happening visually on the psyche of this nation, of the world, that actually really leads to a lot of the problems. And I don't think that there's enough like awareness or media literacy to even control the amount that like we're being bombarded with things that actually aren't really pushing the ball forward in the right way. So I think for myself, I, I really wish there was like more of a, I don't know, which sounds, it sounds odd to say like policing of media, but I feel like there should be like more of like some like education around like how people perceive what they're actually looking at. Cause I think a lot of times it actually reinforces more than actually help people get educated on the things that we're talking about today. Yeah. I, I, I completely hear what you're saying about concerns with the media. I mean, I'm an old guy. I just turned 70 a little while ago. And I remember when there were three television networks and the, the anchors for each network, were each person was an experienced print journalist. They came from that background. And the, the, the news was presented in a way that was not narrow cast as media is now. Now you can obviously find um, a media outlet that reflects your view of the world 100%. And some of those views, as we know, no no reason to go down that rabbit hole right now are very disturbing. And I, I find myself encouraged when I read certain media like the Christian Science Monitor Weekly or The Guardian or Democracy Now. But the people who really need to hear that stuff, they, they're not watching it. They're not reading it and they're not watching it. So uh, I would like to be more um, um, optimistic about where, where I think we're heading. But I think we're in a slow wave civil war right now. And um, I think here in Boston, we're somewhat uh, removed from the, the, the on the ground effects of some of that. But I tell you, if you go to some other parts of the country right now, it scares the hell out of me what's happening. Well, I'm from Indiana. And I, I talked to my nephew about some of the things that uh, he and his friends are seeing and going through, and I'm just saying, oh, my God. So to come back to those common threads, um, if part of the storm is all that which is dividing us and emphasizing um, the things that separate us, where can we find those bonds that can tie us together? Um, how can we build a community that can still make change that can, um, you know, to use Portia's line from the poem that can make no park, no corner, no building off limits. Um, how do we work together? Well, to, just to hop in for a moment, um, I think one thing is to, it, it, it's important to preach to the choir sometimes. It's important to reach people with whom you share values and create common cause and, and, and encourage them because it's easy to, to get discouraged with a lot of the, st the stuff that's going on. So sort of uh, uh, strengthening your own community, encouraging your own community, uh, mentoring young people, uh, being involved in community organizations that are working with our young people, you know, um, um, the, the issue of something 
just to pick one issue out of out of a hat, queer, the fact that there are queer homeless kids who've been kicked out of their homes uh, and on and on the street and, and our society is, is not up in arms about that. That that's something that I, I can't even process. So we've got to take care of each other. That's the first thing I think we gotta do. We gotta take care of each other. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, and if it's safe for you to do so, I think also stepping outside of our, you know, the the folks in the choir, so to speak, because um, I think, Charles, maybe you said this, but sometimes Bo Boston is kind of removed from certain things. Um, and, you know, I don't necessarily know what the solution is, but I do get scared. I think even your language of the storm being, uh, a, I think, a slow wave, civil war or something i haven't really named heard it named that but that's what i've been feeling for the last couple of years right like that's what like some of my art has been reflecting i'm teaching a class at brandeis called apocalyptic poetry you know but it's it is this looming thing that feels like it's been brewing and has been brewing since before i like can't unthink about the insurrection even you know and so sometimes it, it, and i think that moment in particular really made me realize that maybe people always say oh there's two different americas but no i'm like something is going on something has to be going on and i could you know tell folks all the time that this is what needs to happen and this is what we need to do but also those unless those other people know some you know we're still going to be charting down this path and I not to be this person, but I have this quote <laughs> that I'll I'll just share or that I'm thinking about in the context of this, um, which is a quote from the uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, which is that Boston must become a leader among cities. The vision of a new Boston must extend into the heart of Roxbury, into the mind of every child. Boston must conduct the creative experiments and the abolition of ghettos, which will point the way to other communities. Right. So like two things I'm hearing is one, the vision of a new Boston must extend everywhere in every part of Boston. And also then we need to reach out to other communities. So I don't know. I really think about that as the responsibility and the chore, so to speak, of being a cradle. Well said. Yes. Can we talk a little bit more about about place um, since you've you've brought it into the conversation here, Portia? Um, I, and I, in reading your your work, I, I feel like it's a poem that's it's about people and about place. It's it's very much about this place. Um, and as somebody who works with um, historic sites that have a kind of energy built into them because of their their history, we talk a lot about um, the power of place. And I, I'm wondering um, what what all of you on, on the panel think about um, the how we can leverage the power inherent in place to bring our community together and to lift our community up. One of the metaphors that I really liked from uh, Daniel Richter's textbook uh, before the revolution is he uses like the layers of the past that sit on one another, um, you know, and that historians kind of have to be like geologists and, and tourists of Boston have to be able to see those layers all at once, right? There's the, you know, the more fundamental layers, right, where people get thrilled by the idea that they stood in the same spot as uh, as some of these revolutionary events that that speaks to them in powerful ways um, in ways that I don't always uh, uh, fully understand anymore. Um, but I think it's also important to kind of like see Boston from these other more contemporary perspectives as well as Portia does. Right. And kind of say like, well, hey, we, we, we've got these problems all around us now. How can we put ourselves in, in, in other shoes, not necessarily be beholden to the older ways of telling those stories of the past? How can we um, embrace that revolution and, and, and run with it and, and do more things with it going forward? I, right. So it's that idea of layers sitting on top of one another, um, I think, is an important way of thinking about the dialogue between past, present and future. Yeah, ag ag agreed. And I remember when I moved to Bo when I moved to Boston in, in uh, 1975, uh, when I was making my first explorations of the city, 
it really struck me as it strikes me now that one of the most important messages that a person receives from a place is the message, you belong here or you do not belong here. And when the message, uh, as it was at that time, was you don't belong here, uh, the, the idea of going into to, uh, parts of, of South Boston or parts of Charlestown or, or parts of Boston proper, and the message is delivered very clearly that you don't belong here. And I, and, and I see that message uh, has been changing uh, profoundly over these last years in, 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 in many good ways, in some not so good ways because it's become all about money. You know, if you can afford to live in a place, you belong there. But uh, but that aside for a moment, I think the the to, to to answer your question, that one thing that I wish that we could we could do for it, like the people in Portia's poem, is somehow have them feel that these places belong to them as well, and that history isn't just the province of a certain um, subset of the, the human race here in Boston, that, that it, it, it belongs to everyone, that it is the Commonwealth, again, if you will. But I mean, I remember seeing that perspective in the old State House Museum when I first uh, came to Boston, like, you know, many years ago. I mean, I, I don't live there anymore. Right. And like, I mean, in the old South Meeting House is not just the meeting house of Samuel Adams. It's the meeting house of, of Phyllis Wheatley. Right. It, you know, so I do think, right, that like a lot of that change has already been interjected. And I keep thinking about Darren's comment about education. Right. Like. I always tell history majors, right? Like becoming a history major can make you can can give you a better BS detector, right? As you're confronted with um, with the media that we face nowadays, right? So it, it's not adequate by itself, but one has to hope that like ha having an education, being will uh, willing to confront history critically, right, is is a way forward, both in thinking about the history, but also in thinking about uh, our our current challenges. Yeah, and I'll just um, add in thinking about place. I love that, Professor Bang, you called it layers. I usually call it ghosts. You know, I'm uh, <laughs> always saying there's ghosts and I need to think about it or like use it as its power, right? The ghosts that are in this place um, or for like, like New Orleans is a city with a lot of ghosts, right? But I mean, I think Boston is too. Um, and, and more specifically, I'm thinking about you know, the layers, if you will, of, of thinking about, you know, the fact that the poet Phyllis Wheatley um, Peters was lived in Boston and wrote in Boston. And, you know, we are approaching her 250th anniversary of the publishing of her book. And it was published not here. You know, it was published in London. Um, and here we are 250 years later with this Black woman poet as a, the laureate of the city, right? Thinking about these contemporary histories and how <laughs> these layers um, or these ghosts come back, right? And like at this time, what does it mean, you know, for me as an individual being in this place, but also as the place itself, right? What does it mean for us as a city to let this come around? And are we there to acknowledge it? Are we going to acknowledge it? Are we going to celebrate it? Um, cause we did it last time. And also there are so many of those folks that fit that identity and fit those identities as well as others that we also should be acknowledging and praising. And how do we do those in context of each other and, you know, using the, the, the past to, to forward us. Aaron, I feel like the work that you did, um, in your installation at Old South Meeting House, uh, was really playing around with some of these ideas as well. Um, how, how do we, how do we explore who owns a place and how do we broaden the understanding of, of whom that, that place belongs to? Can you tell us a little bit about your work? And am, am, I, am I right that it bumps up against this? Yeah, and the piece uh, went up, looked down. Uh, I guess the, the simple gist of it is it used a live uh, feed camera and uh, I guess like a created video by myself side by side. Um, as a two channel video installation. And I guess the question I mainly was after was how to 
realize how important history is and who how can you add different individuals into that history so a lot of times something becomes historic because we constantly go visit that site or we constantly uh, remember a specific moment and I guess kind of to tie it back to place I think I also want to ask or I would hope to ask the question of how do we invest in a place so we all know Boston's this very transient city. And I think a lot of times it's so easy for someone to be like, oh, I want to go to Harvard or MIT or Boston College or whatever, and then leave. But I think if we start and think like, what does it mean to even come here for a year or two years, or I've been here, I just passed my first decade. It's like, all right, you get to see something, you get to invest, you get to meet individuals like yourself and be involved. And then also hear histories from other people. And I think that was what was so, I guess, sort of uh, eye opening for me was the stories that people gave about Old South Meeting House. The individuals that were in the video talked about going to the Old South Meeting House as a kid and then never wanted to go back again until I invited them to come and shoot uh, a video there. So I think those things you can't get unless you're invested in a place. And then once you're invested in a place, you start to learn these histories and how they're tied in to the fabric of everyone else or the we, um, as the poem says. Thanks, Darren. Um, we're we're um, coming close to the end of the time that we have. So I just want to uh, say to the audience again that we're eager to um, take any questions that you may have for the panelists. So please use the Q&A box if you'd like to, um, to contribute a question. Uh, and I thought maybe um, we could uh, move just in, in the discussion right now to, to that sort of closing image that you, um, that you give us, Portia, which is the idea of a marathon, right, that we are running. And um, it is quite the endurance event. Uh, it, it, is, that, is the marathon a metaphor for history? Is that, is that how you see that? Um, what, what are you trying to say there? Yeah, I mean, I think that well, I don't think it's a metaphor for history, but perhaps time. Sorry, I was teaching a metaphor this week. And so <laughs> a lot of this is all in conversation and also two college students. And I was telling them even today that none of them are from, I realized that none of them are from Boston. And what does that mean? Um, but all of these things are at play right now in my head. Um, but for me, it's not necessarily um, the past, but it does not not mean it's the past. For me, it's more so around time. I think of it as time or a loop of time. Um, or when I think about the, the marathon, um, I also think about the energies associated with it. So it is long. Um, there's a bunch of people running a marathon. Um, there is a finish line. And I think you maybe mentioned the word endurance. Um, but I think about that, the, the, the heaviness of it, the heat of it. Um, also, you know, marathon is a charged word, I think in the city of Boston one, um, and that it's super well known. It also, we ha had a strong storm attached to it. Um, and it's known from really people from across the world come. So I think that that's also attached to it. Um, and the, again, the idea of a we keep doing this thing and keep moving this thing. And then the last line, I really just wanted to poke a little fun um, around, you know, some, some stereotypical ideas surrounding Boston and running and, Dunkin' Donuts. So <laughs> <laughs> it's not Boston without Dunkin' Donuts for sure. <laughs> yeah, I just saw some numbers recently that was like there was about two hundred sixty something Starbucks in the city, and then one thousand one hundred plus uh, Dunkin'. So anyway, <laughs> back to the marathon. Funny. Well, I'm, what what I got uh, from the marathon was. You know, it's a the, the, the process of doing what needs to be done to create community in Boston. It, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's not like there's this, oh, if we do this one thing, if we have this one program, if we do this one event, then everything will be great. Um, nobody um, with, 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 with half a brain thinks that. We, we all realize that it's going to be a it's going to be a process, an ongoing process. And um, there will be no quick fixes to addressing the uh, troublesome issues that we have to face in this city. 
And it's not, you know, I don't want to sound like Debbie Downer there. There's there's a lot of wonderful stuff happening and that can happen. And those two are are marathons. Those those wonderful things too are not going to be accomplished by one event. And now, oh yeah, this wonderful uh institution or activity or community exists. It's an ongoing process of creation. That's nice, Charles. Yeah, I think when I think of uh, the marathon, I also think of like the people that decide to run a marathon. And I think the thing that's really cool and unique about this idea of being a marathon is that you don't have to be like the fastest person to like participate, right? You just need to have the determination for change. And I think that is what's so beautiful about the word marathon to me in this context. Yeah, not to mention so many people come and watch also. So I don't know. There's just so many people involved in it. I have, so, a, what are we, yeah, go ahead. I have a weird personal experience about the 2013 bombing, which is that I, I happened to, I was in New York that year, I, I think, uh, on sabbatical from Tufts. And I came back uh, up after the bombing because I was supposed to hear these um these senior theses for some students that I really liked. And um, and then the manhunt happened and all of central Boston shut down. I, I often think that between climate change and school shootings, we're like growing up in a, a shelter in place society sometimes, because that was what I had to do. And I, I was actually at a bar right on Washington Street, kind of looking up this completely empty street at Old South Meeting House and waiting to see if my if I'd be able to get an Amtrak to take me back uh, to New York. And so when I think about the, the marathon and the Old South Meeting House together and some of these critiques we're making of like what we've done to ourselves uh, in our society, I mean, it is heartening to kind of think about what you guys are talking about, right? Like the commitment of the marathon runners themselves, right? And it, and it not being a sprint, but a, a, but, but a kind of long haul um, event, but uh, you know, but I also think about that that strong storm, right, Portia, as you said, um, because of that 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 one really weird singular experience I had just being being back for for just a couple of days uh, for that moment in April of 2013. Yes, those were strange days. I live in Cambridge, and my phone rang, and it was a recorded message from the Cambridge Police Department telling me to stay the hell home. In in so many words. And um, at one point, I, I went into my bedroom and made made my bed in, in case federal agents rang my doorbell and wanted to come search my place for, for people I was hiding there. Yeah, the, the, the interesting thing about living through a moment of history like that is that it, it immediately creates a sense of bond, right? Um, the shared experience itself becomes one of those common threads that can hold us together. Um, and, and most people who were in Boston at that time can remember that day quite clearly and tell you a story about where they were, what they were doing. Yeah, and seeing a, a, a riot, uh, um, a man in full riot gear with a with an automatic rifle slung over his shoulder, carrying a gallon of milk uh, for um, a family that could not leave their house. Um. I want to come back to the marathon because Portia, I, I found as I was as I was reading your work, one of the things that I found myself wondering is what we're running toward. And I wanted to ask our panel if you if you have a vision of that. Um, what is that dream that we are running toward? What do you think we're running toward, or what? What would we like to to want? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. Our, I mean, our esteemed poet already confessed herself to be an Afro pessimist, so we might not like the answer. <laughs> <we might. laughs> I'll let you all choose which version of the question you want to answer. I think I am asking you as readers, um, uh, as you as you read the poem, what is it that you think um, that we are moving toward what is it that that you see as that that dream that that Porsche's runners are are headed toward well I, I will say what what I would like to think that we are what we are headed toward 
is is a society where people care about each other, where it's not a zero sum, where, where life is not a zero sum game, where you know you 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 win and 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 I lose. Um, I like to see us. I, I like to see. I'll just put it out. I like to see the the great mass of white people who are terrified that they're losing their control over what what this this community has been. Um, that they that they will see the inclusion of others who have been excluded not as a dilemma, but as an opportunity. Yeah, I'm thinking about uh, the um, well. One, I imagine the running as a continuation of life, um, and what we're running towards. I think that is really exciting to think about. Um, and I'm upset at myself for getting, for forgetting to think about that. What is the thing that we're building towards? You know, I think sometimes that's also how the revolution goes, you know, it's like tearing everything down. And also what is this thing that we're actually moving towards? And, you know, sometimes as a futurist, I always use the example of the declaration of independence that like people, you know, these white men got in this room and they said, Hey, this is, we're about to do this country thing. And this is what, what it's going to look like. And that really is kind of futurist, you know? And so I think, you know, it's a matter of people, you know, the marathon of folks getting together to like decide what do we actually want this to look like and then building towards that, keeping all of those other things in mind or like remembering the past, right? Really, that's what the pessimist believes is that you cannot you cannot move forward if you don't acknowledge what had what happened, right? And so thinking about that as as we map towards something. I mean, it, it used to be fashionable among revolutionary historians to really critique the, the revolution as being nationalist in an exclusionary way, not really living up to its ideas of uh, equality or liberty, right? And all of that is um, is true. But I think, you know, in the wake of events like the January 6th attack on the Capitol, right, there's a sort of yearning to return to like, hey, some of the core ideas of the revolution, right, of like really trying to uh, uh, build a, a, a de democracy in which uh, um, opposition can uh, thrive in a healthy way, right? That like, um, you know, that some of the, the, that all of a sudden we want to return to some of the ideals that the, that, or at least a better version of the ideals that the that the founders had laid out. Gardner, you think of what che, Go che Guevara said, that the true revolutionary is guided by feelings of love. You know, that that yeah. that needs to stay in the mix. It needs to stay in the mix. Yeah, the, the the end of the poem where it says we're still running is the part that gives me the chills every single time because it feels like one of those like to the nth degree entendres that you just I don't know if it's positive or negative or the the result of what we're running towards. But I guess I would hope that we would all run towards a more common shared idea of what our history is. And I feel like a lot of times I can talk to someone that seems to know everything, but then they'll turn around and go, Darren, why don't black people swim? And then I'll be like, oh man, let's talk about these pools, these public pools. And then they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, oh man. All right. So I guess I just hope that like one day we can see a, a common history for what it is. And uh, I think from there, maybe we'll have a better jumping off point for something new in the future. Right. And uh, uh, a lot, Portia, like you say, cheering for anyone, cheering for everyone, you know, that. Uh... I was going to quote the same line. I mean, the, the poem doesn't talk about love, but I, I had that same reaction that that's really what the poem is about. I mean, it uses the word heart right toward the end. Um, but I was going to, yeah, I was going to pick up on that same line about the cheering, too. And it's a tough love. You know, it's not a sappy, sentimental love. No. Uh, so you got to work for it. You got to work for it. You got to work for it. Well, on that note of love and common threads and cheering, uh, I think that is all that we have time for this evening. So I want to stop here. Uh, I want to make sure that I say thank you to Portia for this beautiful work that she's shared with us this evening. Thank you for inviting me to do this. And I just want to thank all the panelists for like having this conversation. That was really exciting. And um, 
yeah, I feel honored and blessed and just grateful to be here with y'all. Yeah, thank you to the panelists for this great program. Thanks to our audience for being here with us this evening. Um, I wish we had more time to continue the conversation, but what I will say is that I look forward to continuing to explore all of these ideas with all of you uh, in the audience and on this panel further um, as this exciting year of programs and performances and exhibits continues. And as we continue to ask how um, this important part of our nation's history can serve as a tool um, for looking forward and for being forward. Um, so thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you to WGBH's Forum Network for co-producing the program with us tonight. To learn more about WGBH's Forum Network and how you can support their work, please visit their website at www.forumnetwork.org. And to learn more about Revolutionary Spaces, the Old State House and Old South Meeting House, and how your generosity can support a citywide celebration of a founding narrative in which we all have a stake during this important commemorative year, please visit us at www.revolutionaryspaces.org. We appreciate your continued support and look forward to seeing all of you very soon. Thank you. <laughs>